Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Media Education Lab. This is a webinar on inequalities in media education, and we're joined today by the founders of FemLab. Um, I'll be adding all the links in chat uh, in a minute, uh, so you will get to see the fabulous work that they do uh, by clicking on those links. Um, we're joined by Professor Paila Jora and Professor Usha Raman. Um, they founded FemLab uh, a short while ago, and they've managed to do a lot of amazing work. Uh, they've had workshops, uh, a book uh, that they've released recently. And the best part about it is that it's open access. And I'm going to add the link here in, in chat. Um, today, they have something really exciting uh, for us. And without wasting too much time, I'm going to hand it over to Professor Aruda and Ron. Thanks, everyone. Uh... So Usha, do you want to go next? And you know, we we've got this drill going since we both are, uh, you know, uh, have been doing this round promoting fam uh, the book. So anyway, I'm really happy to see you all. Uh, you know, since this is a cozy group, you know, I think we can have deeper conversations. I hope you know, and let's leverage on that, especially because it looks like people are coming from very different backgrounds. So just a, we're gonna do a five minutes sort of snapshot of it. What is FemLab, you know, and what's you know the culminating of this uh, our projects to the book, and then we'd uh, like to pose some questions and have a you know a breakout two breakout groups now. I see it's a small group, so maybe we do one. I mean, we we discuss amongst ourselves. I was, I was I think. thinking the same. Yeah, I was thinking because the same. maybe we could just do it in one. Yeah, group. yeah, and we want, and then after that, let's let's have. We want to also show you two videos before the discussion. These animations, which were part of a project. So okay, I think we, I'm getting ahead. Basically, um, about you know, a month before COVID, remember that thing? You know, <laughs> it's like in January, uh, Usha and I uh, got this IDRC grant from Canada for uh, a generous amount to do field work on uh, marginalized women workers in the gig economy in Bangladesh and India. And then the you know the next month COVID struck and it challenged us deeply in how we create these connections, particularly because we're looking at really marginalized populations who don't readily just come online and start chatting, right? Especially women workers, which was our focus. So um, you know we had to also create a culture in a team which was spread across India and Bangladesh doing work remotely. So how do you build that sort of bonding? And we did leverage on digital media technologies, like we had weekly or month, some you know biweekly um, Zoom meetings, and we created this culture of space online, which. Um, not just with that in team internally, but also with a variety of stakeholders. And we created this blog space because we felt like uh, people had all these thoughts and emotions. And it was almost like a cathartic channel, right? To be able to express yourself while you're going through the pandemic. And so every time they engaged with someone, whether it was with a business person, a computer, uh, you know, a, a programmer at Ola Mobility or, uh, you know, different, just very different stakeholders. They would, uh, our team would capture their voices. And then we started involving the stakeholders themselves because you realize some of them were very articulate. And so, you know, from 2020 and as of this year, we really, uh, we decided that uh, the, these blogs were really compelling, that it, it deserved to become a book. And so we invited select uh, participants which are outside of academia from web foundation adobe unhcr and you know a whole list of people um you know from designers programmers web educators etc to entrepreneurs to contribute their pieces extend it uh, give it deeper meaning and connect it in what constitutes as a feminist approach to the digital economy uh and the future of work what is the nature of that right uh, who's a worker what is work? You know, how do we question some very banal topics, particularly with all these new technologies around us? And to some extent, should we be questioning them, right? And so, yeah, this culminated in this open access book with Amsterdam University Press. And uh, we're really thrilled that it's open access and anyone can read and engage and share. And uh, yeah, I'll stop here and pivot to Usha on um, the question and how to move forward on this. 
So yeah, so thanks again. Thanks to Devina and Yonti and others in this group for asking us. Um, and I've, of course, been here before, have met some of you in connection with other work. Um, but just to um, broaden the, the context of what Kyle was talking about, um, for those of you who have seen the book, of course, you may already know uh, what it's all about. Um, but uh, when we started the project, the idea was to try and understand how women workers at the margins, those who were engaged in, in, in informal work, um, how um, you know they interacted with technology, the role work played in their lives, how they were able to balance work and life, um, whether they formed communities around work, whether they used technology to form communities. So these were the broad questions that we entered the field with. And the field really was um, five sectors where in India and Bangladesh, uh, there were large numbers of women either already uh, working in those sectors or they were beginning to enter those sectors in large numbers. So we looked at women in the ride hailing sector, uh, you know, uh, like Uber and Ola in India. Ola is, in, is a company in India, very much like Lyft and Uber elsewhere. Um, so we were looking at uh, that sector. Then we looked at um, the sanitation sector. Uh, and I'll explain in a little bit why these very disparate sectors. So sanitation, women uh, who were engaged in um, you know, work with the municipal corporation or in domestic uh, um, house cleaning activities. Uh, we were looking at women who were doing salon work, but engaging in work through platforms. Um, and, um, and then we looked at two other sectors. One was construction and the other was um, artisan and work. And, and again, why these sectors, they seem very disparate. Some of them are clearly platformized sectors. Some of them are not. But um, all of you will agree that the digital penetrates all aspects of life, even if we are not directly interacting with the digital. So um, for a woman artisanal worker, um, even if she doesn't uh, get her work through a platform, often the contractor that is hiring her services or giving her job work is, um, is on a platform um, and marketing her work through a platform. Similarly, in construction work, while the women may not be contracted through a platform, the payment happens through a platform. So in some way or another, the digital interfaces with these women. So in the context of what we're talking about today, uh, which is uh, you know, the framework of global inequalities, I think it's important for us to understand um, you know, how these inequalities are layered over existing inequalities. So while the digital may create a certain kind of inequality, more often than not, it's a layer that um, is uh, over an existing inequality from other dimensions, um, often on basis of gender or class or in India caste, uh, in other places race. Um, and digital inequalities tend to be, um, you know, uh, they either exacerbate or in many cases, they also help people overcome inequality. So uh, what we'd like to do um, in the course of the time we have here is one, to show you these two short animations. And um, they're from different sectors. Uh, they are based on conversations that uh, we had, our research team had with women in, in these sectors. Um, so you get a sense of um, the field that we uh, were looking at. And uh, as you watch these uh, videos, uh, we have a few questions that we'd like you to think about in, uh, when we, uh, once we're done watching, then maybe we can discuss them. So um, maybe Davina can put those questions in the chat box. And uh, as you watch the videos, just think about them and then we'll come back and talk about it. Um, anything you'd like to add, Bayer? Yeah. Actually, um, maybe we should, after all, divide into two groups because that way people get to introduce themselves and engage. Um, it's still enough. I think we could go deeper. That's fine, actually. That's the, it'll be a small okay. group, but it's actually maybe yeah. good. So uh, my suggestion was that we all watch both videos and then split into two groups for the discussion. 
so that when we come back to the plenary, everyone has an idea of what the context um, of the other discussion is. Is that okay? In the walled old city of Hyderabad dwell nearly 4,000 families that are involved in bangle making. This is the story of the women that spend long days hunched over studying these bangles. What are their working conditions? What is their pay? Does working help them live a better, more independent life? Are they respected for their artisanship? Can they collectivize? A typical day starts at 10 a.m. and goes on until anything between 11 p.m. to midnight. Depending on the workload, some women work well into the morning until 2, sometimes 4 a.m. Most women work out of their homes, which means housework does not stop while they make bangles. Children often surround these women and sometimes lend a hand in the bangle making. Typically, the supplier would hand them the raw materials, the bangle with either dry or wet lac, the stones that are used for embellishments and a sample bangle to indicate the pattern. They are paid a fixed amount per bangle which ranges from about 50 paise to a rupee. Long hours of work and the intricate nature of work takes a toll on health. Many develop eye problems, allergies, rashes, sores and back and neck pains. Almost half of the money earned goes into buying medication. Seeing their products in the market should make for happy visuals. But that is not the case for they know that they are sold at a much higher price, much beyond what they are paid for their labour. The idea to organise themselves for collective bargaining for better rates seems improbable. Usme gents hona parta hai. One has to be a man. So these women, despite being earning members of the society, remain constricted to the domestic sphere. While they may feel a sense of personal satisfaction by contributing to the household income, they don't experience the kind of freedom that should come with economic independence. A day in the life of a female cab driver. can go on to the next as well. Yeah. A day in the life of a female cab driver. It's the big city blur. You sneak a moment away from your phone to see your cab approaching. You barely look away from your phone because you're in a rush to get to your destination. But something is different. You have a female cab driver. Perhaps that makes you do a double take, spare an amused smile, maybe say a few words of encouragement. But do we spare a thought about what it takes for a woman to get behind the wheel? What does her average day look like? What makes her experience different from male drivers? This is the story of a female cab driver in a big Indian city. She is employed by an all-female cab company that caters to women and children passengers. Her day starts at 7 a.m. For a fixed monthly salary, an average day runs from anything between 3 hours to 12 hours, depending on the number of rides. She rests assured in the fact that her customers are only women or children. She is grateful to her employer who coordinates the rides and pickups for her. But let's go back a little further. Before she can pick up rides, she has to go through training. The training for this role is not limited to learning driving and road navigation skills. She has to be trained in confidence building, spoken English, self-defense and first aid. She also needs to have a supportive family that lets her work. If she is lucky enough to have parents that look after home matters, the children will chip in on after-hours training teaching her how to navigate apps and maps. The ride-hailing sector continues to be dominated by male members. 
challenges abound for women breaking into the profession. From people's perception to algorithm design to safety to accessing basic sanitation on the job. Once when one man got into the vehicle, after reaching halfway he said, As you are a lady, I got into the vehicle. As in front of other people, if I say I do not want your vehicle, you will feel bad. But for me, after reaching home, my wife will make issues. So after reaching near to home, please let me get down. And as we reached halfway to his house, he got down. When I called, they said as this is a woman driver, they didn't require the ride and they only required male drivers. Some people feel very happy if it is women drivers. They may say, if it is women drivers, we can go safely, feel mentally relaxed. Some people like this and some others think otherwise. There are two categories of people like this. Two gentlemen flat out told me women are not meant to be behind the wheel. You know, they're just meant to be in the kitchen. Yeah, that's the reason why I was totally uncomfortable. Would you like me to go to breakouts immediately? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think everybody would have seen the questions that you've put there. So if we could have you think about this and um, you know, discuss in you know, groups and then we come back into the plenary room. And so one group would be thinking through uh, um, these questions with reference to the artisanal worker. And the other group would uh, be thinking through the same questions in relation to the uh, cab driver. Opening all rooms. and their own work so that was really fascinating in my group but I'm sure Usha's too but we could open yeah, I, it up you know yeah I think I mean maybe one of the others in the group can chime in but um, I think we um, ended up talking not so much about the three questions but about the context of um, whether the digital, how the digital can help connect the market to uh, the worker and so on. Yeah. And um, for us, what we were talking about, actually a number, so number of people are, uh, in our group was in the training, like digital training and using gaming platforms and all the kinds of platforms to, uh, you know, and we would, actually there's much more optimism in our group uh, or because it's the idea of how you can use digital technologies to, uh, you know, train on the go and which actually is really pertinent because uh, technologies are changing so quickly and our field of work is getting really disrupted in multiple, maybe in a humbler way or in more dramatic ways, but you do need all constant training and our school systems and university systems in place are rather frozen and, um, you know, slow to shift. So I think there's enormous potential. And uh, also I thought there was a, you know, um, really interesting examples of uh, projects where, like um, uh, Gazala's explaining, uh, uh, where during the pandemic, it spurred enormous amount of collectivity through WhatsApp groups, et cetera, amongst women uh, homemakers and how they made it into a business. Uh, and I thought the numbers were really impressive from, what was it, uh, Gazala, you said like, um, was yeah, a small so they number. started with a small group of 50 like-minded friends and the yeah. group right now resonates with uh, the strength of women uh, up to around 30,000 and they're from all over the world who are connected on this platform buying and selling and doing business yeah and i thought this that's really Facebook. impressive i mean so just to you know there's another another conversation this opens up to is this uh usha and i have met so many interesting activists and workers and uh, one of the common threads running across in this book is this need for formalizing the informal because we all know okay, much of these sectors are informal nature. The question is, and then we're all on board about let's get it formalized. But what does that actually mean in different contexts when it comes to the ride hailing sector? When, what are the interesting innovations and even in local governance, you know, in a, at a national level, maybe a transnational level, which is 
allowing uh, for these changes, like a safety net, for example, right? Uh, for gig work, uh, the gig work sounds like rather, but isn't that going to become the norm in a way, right? For the future of all work, maybe uh, as we can go across and we can be much more mobile, right? I mean, that's just one potential future in particular sectors, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, Usha? And I think uh, like Serena was, yeah, no, Serena, would you like to make the point that you were making about the fact that it's not just access, but much more than that when it comes to um, the, the digital? Yeah, um, he had just started talking about the, the greater sphere of what it means to do any one particular work and how it's not just that one action or that one skill it's everything that goes into being able to then do to there to be able to do it and access to the internet access to you know digital tools obviously you know as you you were just talking about definitely helps in that bigger sphere of everything that comes together and everything that culminates into being able to do the work you know make ends meet and access is so much more than just being able to say, oh, I have internet connection or, oh, I have a mobile phone. What does it, what does it take to have that, right? Do you have the infrastructure? Do you have, how do you, you know, what's the chicken and egg? How do you get the thing that you need if you don't have, you don't have the, the money coming in to pay for it? But, you know, so there's so many more things involved when you talk about access um, and it's all, almost a parallel wicked problem yeah. in and of itself but it's crucial as you're saying to how people generate the community and that um like the community knowledge that they're you know they're sharing with each other about how they can elevate themselves in their own work um and so i mean in that way digital you know digital access helps build that community of knowledge sharing um which is a different way of engaging I guess goes more like there it's the informal way that people are engaging and learning and growing, but through a formal, maybe organized method, such as on an app on WhatsApp. Right. But yeah, a lot more goes into just being able to access. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And you know, there's this whole social cultural dimension as uh, we were speaking about the right healing sector is that, you know, a number of women, on, uh, there's a huge stigma in being a female driver because she's considered loose roaming around the streets with strangers and that constitutes and so either there's a stigmatization of the kind of work so uh, so technically yes you can enroll but what are the ba social culture barriers that prevent you from doing that or if you go online and become a, a woman influencer then you're considered too loose if you become an influencer i mean you know there's a point there's an optimal point where you get a lot of misogynistic comments and all so uh, you don't you 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 actually cease from optimizing the attention economy in the way others so there it's not a technical barrier it's a social cultural barrier and so there's a number of those aspects and what was interesting in our uh, research that uh, in the sectors is either women did not want to identify themselves as part of a sector or were quiet, right? Uh, because they didn't want to be visible and heard. Um, sometimes they actually didn't see their work as legitimate. So construct people, women in, in the construction sector or in the artisanal sector, they just said it's something they do. Like they just, like we assist around, you know, but actually it is work. It's just that they were actually doing work, whether it's in the, you know, bangle making, et cetera. It's just that they saw it fused into child caring and something in between because it's not a, the perception of work is uninterrupted, blocks of time, pure, free from the domestic sphere, right? So I thought that was actually also very interesting. Uh, but I'm wondering if we could pose a, like, a, you know, I'm curious if any of you have an uh, idea of where, how would you define uh, the future of, a, or like, how do you define the uh, what uh, is work in the, you know, age of generator media and new technologies? Do you feel that we need to revisit that definition or 
do you feel that it's more that we have to stay true to what constitutes the work and systems need to change? If just, if I just can, to, okay. Yeah. Okay. I think Ramona Ramona wants to say something, but you're on mute. You need to you need to come off yeah. mute. Yeah. I think that the what this question poses um doesn't just affect women. I think that what we have defined as work, you know, we've moved through the industrial revolution. We have moved into uh, we, what you could do manually was uh, well paid to an age where if you are not able to text, um, you're back in the Industrial Revolution. So I think that the concept of work is in an evolutionary space and particularly for women because we are coming from being considered, oh, you're supposed to be in the kitchen not in the court in the courtroom. Okay. So I'm just using that as a connection. Uh you know, and that we are really as a world um grappling with what is the work, how is it paid how and depending on the kind of work, uh what is its value in terms of money? Um and I think we have to get to another sense what is work as it relates to your passion for your own life and your own well-being? So I think that we don't think about health when we think about defining work. And sitting over a computer all day will affect your health, all right? Uh, just as it is the bangle lady sitting on, over a table banging a hammer. You know, it's what, what, what one is keyboards, one is a hammer, you know? Um, or the cat, the driver, uh, yeah, hammering the brakes. So um, I just wanted to say that we need to put this question that has just been posed in a greater alignment with understanding. Usha, ma'am, I interrupted you. Um, you were saying something and I interrupted you. Yeah, I've, I've lost that thought, but... Um... I think what I was, what I wanted to add to it, or to expand Pyle's question into what is work, I think, um, particularly when we think about the digital, uh, we often think only of that point of contact between the human and the digital, and we lose sight of all the other layers that enable that particular uh, work. So if we're talking about, and I think, you know, Pyle uh, is doing more work in this area than I am, but let's say we talk about uh, AI tools, right? So what, what enables artificial intelligence is often not considered when we're talking about um, AI tools. So for instance, the data sets that go into training AI, who's creating those data sets, whose labor has um, actually generated that data. Um, so we, we tend to lose sight of the kind of work that lies under technology. Um, so maybe that's something to think about. I mean, how does one then claim, lay claim to the labor that has gone into those systems? So for instance, with, um, influencers right i mean there's this very popular book uh, that came out recently which uh, talks about how you don't get paid for doing what you love um so influencers often are dismissed because they're just doing things that they like but that is actually fueling a whole attention economy so do we recognize that as labor do we recognize that as work um so that's another kind of um, that's another way to think about that question, perhaps. Yeah, and just to also uh, touch here upon your point, Ramona, is I thought you brought up a very good argument about it being about the value of work. You know, we are we should be asking how do we value certain kinds of work over the others, and why? What are the what's the logic behind giving that kind of weight and value, and that there's a larger historical process to it. And this also translates really well into 
today's, you know, AI based technologies, because we are literally giving weight to certain kind of variables that go into data sets and standardize it as a norm, you know? So I think th there's much to be learned about that process and the logic of value devaluing and feminist approaches have a history and trajectory of capturing how, uh, you know, uh, marginalized populations have been systematically devalued because they've even entered into that domain. Right, like teaching used to be a respected male profession historically until women came in and then it became, uh, you know, uh, far cheaper and easier. And then same thing with nursing, same thing. You can just go into every industry women have then entered and corrupted it and devalued it as, a, you know, as a group and also other marginalized groups, right? Uh, nursing is not just women, it's, it, it's intersecting, it's women of color, you know, particularly from international environments. But uh, yeah, Ghazana. Yeah, and so, uh, actually, Davina, to... do you have yeah. your hand up? I, I, I didn't know if there's, oh, sorry. I yeah. I, I didn't know it was a old, yeah. Did you, because I know yours was before. So do you want to chime in and then Ghazala? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Ghazala. I'll go after you. Okay, so I, I, in fact, I was just uh, thinking very on very similar lines like Payal and what I was trying to say was that when you talk about kind of, you know, redefining the word word, I think yeah, it definitely needs to be revisited because work, uh, to my understanding, still kind of, you know, is a binary marker. It is a very gendered layering. And I think, you know, we need to degender the work because work uh, primarily is, you know, work is uh, somebody is considered to be a worker you know if he's doing serious stuff say you know what men do for example till very late till the time the supreme court judgment in india also came in you know uh household work or homemakers i mean their work was like totally unpaid labor and it was not considered work work so to speak so kind of you know degendering that work and kind of you know looking at it you know from a what should i say a neutral gender perspective is something which needs uh, which we need to sensitize people about also thank you so I, yes i had two questions which were sort of related um i wanted to ask both uh, professor raman and professor arora um when i look at the way in which we define work when someone is working within the digital and social media arena, I feel like there's a collapse of uh, how much labor goes into a certain, um, say, profession, for instance. Now, whether it's formalized, so say, for instance, I am a young person who wants to be a social media manager. You could actually divide that work into so many different things, right? You could be a photographer, you could be a copywriter, you could be X, Y, Z, but then it all gets collapsed into this one position who becomes the overworked person who becomes the social media manager of certain accounts. Now, that's the formal aspect of it. But also informally, I feel like if someone is an influencer or a content creator, they also have this collapsing of labor that's happening. They're also uh, the research and the writing, the pre-production bit. They're also involved in the production aspect and also the post-production aspect of uh, the content that they're creating. So that is one tangent. And oh my God, I forgot the other tangent. That was my question. It'll come to me. But maybe if you could respond to the first one. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think both things have happened, right? So um, there is one... Um, uh, trajectory of um, different aspects of work collapsing, like you're saying, you know, earlier, even if you look at journalism or media, it used to be that uh, someone would do, um, you know, the text, someone else would take the photograph, someone else would do the videos, someone else would do the captioning. But now, you're, if you're a multimedia journalist, you're doing everything. And so all those individual um, uh, uh, jobs have disappeared and have collapsed into this one figure of the multimedia journalist. Um, so that's one kind of, um, that's one thing that has happened to work, that multiple types of work have collapsed uh, into a single job. But then I think the opposite also has happened, right? So you have, um, in terms of super specialization, 
So where you have people knowing, doing very, very specific things, which perhaps used to be managed by, um, um, I mean, which used to be part of a larger job description. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of examples now, but probably more in laboratory sciences or, you know, those kinds of fields than um, in media. Um, I think in media, it's more of what you are saying, you know, where um, things have collapsed, or various tasks have collapsed into one job. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I also I going do, really yeah. close to, say, you know, being at the university, like Usha and I are at the university and things have changed quite a bit. It's like, I think part of it has become more and more new liberal. So I've noticed in the last decade, we are supposed to be societal impact figures. We're supposed to be uh, influencers ourselves. We're supposed to like, uh, also not just that, we have to pay for our position, you know, by applying for grants and the list goes on of what our tasks have become and morphed into. So it's it's fascinating that, uh, and all this still within that same breadth of time, but this busyness uh, does not actually translate necessarily with more original ideas. In fact, we're supposed to be, because there are rubrics that actually fuel this kind of busyness and validate it, right? So when we're talking about value, going back to, you know, Ramona's also question about how do we value work, the worker, is that there are also systems in place that uh, sort of make it, uh, it consolidate around it, like the metrics and you know, rubrics, as if it's sacrosanct, as if it always has been, right? And then we start to think in those logics, like, oh, my value is based on X number of publications, that many games I've produced, this many d reports I've written. And we now know that uh, because of that, innovation is actually decreasing in many regards because of the lack of replication studies, because you're not valorized by, you know, replicating something because that's not groundbreaking and so you are basically producing a lot of you may be publishing 10 but not doing deep research longitudinal research quality research and so we don't really know often the impact of say medicines technologies you know our own gaming systems because we're so busy of being fast and furious you know and like and putting it out there as, as soon because that's what is now valued the process of a certain kind of work which is valued now more so than the uh you know than in the past so mm, yeah yeah Devina you said you had a, a question on creativity yes I I remember so it, this is going back to the idea that Ramona mentioned about value. Um, one may argue that creativity and innovation is spurred from a lot of copying that we do. So, for instance, if I were an artist, I would copy the greats and then understand where my strengths lie and then become an artist in my own, of my own. Versus that's what generative AI is all about, right? They, they get fed all of these data sets and then they create a copy for you. For instance, if I if I feed 10 ads and tell them to generate an ad like that by identifying what the CTA is, for instance, and they would generate a copy for me. So what is creativity then? And because there's all of this AI art that we see, which is, you know, fantastic, futuristic, sometimes so close to what we see as like sometimes there are examples where you can't differentiate which is AI art and which one is art by a human being and then what does it all mean for larger issues like um, what is creativity or even more law-based issues like what is copyright well I mean not to take go to off study. the sorry Usha? No, no, I just wanted to add something to that and maybe you can respond to both uh, points. Um, so I was talking to a student recently and, um, you know, this this question around creativity and, you know, how AI generates um, new stuff, so-called new stuff. So she said, but isn't that what we all do? We're socialized, we're trained, 
using data sets. We don't call them data sets, but we're exposed to um, various stimuli. And then what we produce is the result of that, um, you know, of that over time. So how is that different from from generative AI was her question. So yeah. I, I suppose I suppose why I want to ask this question is because more often than not, given that we are in an inequalities uh, and media education webinar series, a lot of this becomes co-opting of art and co-opting of uh, stuff or data that is being generated by uh, Global South into Global North. I think that's why this is one of my questions. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I know we don't have much time, but um, we have like two minutes. But uh, you know, if part of the concern about generative AI is that it's not actually just copying; it's actually creating something new. It's not exactly like so. Your example of you know, in the old good old days where we'd literally render a copy of whatever artwork, it's not doing that. That's what's creating a lot of the panic. Uh, older technologies was were doing that right now that being said is that you know this it, it's like the uh, it's it's a one is arguing that is it an actor in is it a, is it actually laboring you know and or is it a tool so do you see it as an actor who is a laborer and so it's a creator and then that's the language and rhetoric is like is ai replacing me right so or is it a tool like um, the camera, which did replace a certain kind of work and aesthetic and generate a new form of aesthetic, but didn't fully replace it because it also gave meaning to the older style, right? And it gave it a different kind of value. So, and this goes into the history of whether it's radio to now today's podcasts, right? So it, it has given meaning to a particular sort of media experience from the past, but also created new experiences. So I think uh, I think these are good questions and I, I can see that we are <laughs> the tail end of this, but it's it's been really wonderful. I know it's it, it wasn't quite steered in very concrete ways, but I like the sort of beautiful chaos and I hope this had some value for you all too. And thank you for your okay. inputs and Devina. Thank you. Absolutely. I kind of maybe misused my facilitator privileges and asked you two questions, but well, <laughs> so me. Uh, um, I've also added um links to a deep dive podcast that it's Ushagami and Spyla Zora were a part of uh, on Apple and Spotify. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, for accepting my invitation and we really I, mean, I enjoyed the animation um i'm sure everyone enjoyed the breakout as well thank you all attendees um i'm also putting down links in chat for our next webinar uh on inequalities uh in the education series in the series it's on immigrant influencers on tiktok um that's by dr daniela haramio um and our next media club information is coming in as well. We will be discussing a handbook on media literacy and media education research methods. Uh, here's the link to that. And thank you so much for staying on. I know we're a minute late than usual. And see you around next time. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.